Hi, I'm John Byrne with Poets and Quants. We're here at Center Court in Houston. And guess where we are? We're in a baseball stadium. Well, kind of. You can't see the field from here, but we are at the front and center of Minute Maid Park, the Astrodome, the home of the Houston Astro. And just behind us, home plate, not far. Yeah, not too far. You can actually run in the field if you'd like, Eric. Did you, did, you, did you mention home of the world champion? I Astros? should mention that, but as a Yankee fan, I want to play that down. <laughs> We're pretty proud of that. All right, we have two terrific guests. Uh, let me introduce the person to my immediate left, uh, Barbara Ostick. And she is a senior associate dean of degree programs at Rice University's Jones School, Jones Graduate School. Um, I'm really happy to have you here. And we Thank also you, have Eric Johnson from Vanderbilt University's Owen Graduate School of Management. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, so this week happens to be the 10th anniversary of the demise of Lehman Brothers. And when Lehman Brothers went down, you know, I was working at Business Week. We were right across the street from Lehman headquarters, and I could see people with their cardboard boxes filing outside their office. And as you know, that brought the onset of the Great Recession and a lot of hand-wringing about management education and whether all these MBAs destroyed the economy and Wall Street. Uh, obviously, that was an over-exaggeration. Um, but to what extent did, did business schools and management education change as a result of what occurred 10 years ago? Who wants to take that first? You can start her. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think what's, what's fascinating to me is, of course, you know, business schools all over started to, to really get more serious around the ethics education and uh, components of that. But, you know, when I really think about it, I think today, too, the students have changed so much. And the way they think about uh, their MBA and what they want to do with it has changed. In many ways. And I think that's had almost as much effect as... as you know, the kinds of things we might have done in a program. You know, so for example, at Vanderbilt, one of our most popular centers is called the Center for Social Ventures. And we have students who are off uh, working on building businesses at the bottom of the pyramid to help alleviate poverty. And, and a lot of that's really them, they, you know, their passion and their interest. I think that the, a lot of the things that were already in place, trends that were already started, were just took a a steeper turn uh, yeah. after that. Yeah. And, and, and it was both on the demand side and the supply side in terms of what we're focusing on and what the, what the market demands that we focus on, whether that's the uh, entrepreneurial endeavors uh, that continue to gain popularity or a foot, your operations, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the this resurgence and in interest in, in operations and, and that uh, have a different flavor, I think, yeah. than. And a lot of alien Mm -hmm. AI. Another consequence in the past 10 years has been the decline of finance as a popular place for MBAs to go and the rise of technology. I mean, in a way, technology has taken away many of the people who would have normally gone into financial services, investment management, uh, less so with PE and VC, but those are really hard jobs to get for MBAs unless they have previous experience in the field. So you've also seen that sort of shifting landscape in where MBAs are landing. Uh, is that because a lot of MBAs who went to Wall Street in that year when it collapsed found themselves out on the street, <laughs> or what? I think it's a number of things that, are, that, that run much deeper than that in yeah. terms of what is, what's driving this generation of students, in terms of the uh, where the where, what the seeds that have been planted in their undergraduate days, uh, in terms of where the excitement is, where the value creation is in the economy, and wanting to be part of that, and certainly the crisis played into uh, a view that uh, I'm a finance professor, so this, this is difficult for me to say, but that the, <laughs> that that it may not be that the Wall Street is the is the uh, the best place to to always create value. Right. And on top of that, so many jobs on Wall Street disappeared forever. Yes. And it wasn't because of so much a change in finance as it was a result of automation and AI mm -hmm. and all these other kinds of things. That were, there were many, many kind of entry level, all those sales and trading jobs that, you know, at one time were very manual and 
many of them have been automated away, and, and um, there's still a lot of really cool jobs in finance and Wall Street, but there's not that huge bottom of the pyramid place where lots and lots and lots of MBAs are filing. Now, I'm going to ask you what may appear to be a strange question, but for many non-traditional applicants, it's not. Who gets an MBA? Are they all, you know, masters of the universe, sharp elbow, greedy people who are only interested in money? I mean, I think the great thing about MBA uh, land today is it's probably more diverse than it's ever been in the sense that, I mean, your organization, Poets and Quants, I think that describes it well in, the, in that we have people from almost every background that end up in our programs today. Many, many coming back from, San, for example, Teach from America or something like that. They may have been teaching, you know, third grade somewhere to folks who have already been in finance and were... Uh, uh, undergraduate degrees in, in finance or some quantitative area. And we see that, you know, all across our program, huge diversity in backgrounds. What I like to say is if I were <laughs> queen of the world, and there's still a chance that that could happen, if I were queen of the world, I would rename the degree. Huh. The master's, master's is good. I like that, that part. And business is okay, uh, but I think that doesn't have a robust meaning to a lot of people. And the administration part, that's no good at all. Yeah, that's a bore. That, yeah, that is not <laughs> what we are after at all. Uh, I, the, the way we think about it when we build the programs and what we hope we're doing for our students is about value creation. And if I could rename it, I'd call it the Masters of Value Creation. Mm. And so it, the people that want to create value, that's who's coming to get their MBA in whatever way. A lot of, yeah. Building things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what's happened in the industry is the MBA has emerged as sort of an all purpose degree. I mean, you mentioned before you see um, uh, people from, from fields that you may not have seen before in MBA programs. A lot of nonprofit people, social enterprise, uh, government people, people from healthcare. Um, where years ago, a lot of those people, even though they didn't want to be lawyers, would go to law school for the more disciplined uh, mm -hmm. way of thinking that would serve them well throughout whatever career they chose. But it seems to me like much, many more people are, are looking at, at an MBA education uh, almost as a substitute to, to the people who went to law school and didn't want to be lawyers. Do you find that? I mean, I guess, yes, and, and on top of that, I mean, I always say the MBA is kind of a uniquely American idea. Uh, this idea today that you can kind of reinvent yourself uh, maybe four or five years after undergraduate school. Um, you go to Europe, that idea is not embedded in the European thinking, and I think that's why it's taken Europe so long to kind of create what looks like an American MBA. It's that, you know, if you're in Switzerland at, at, at eighth grade, it's kind of you're going left or right at, at Elm Street. You're heading to the factory, you're heading to the uh, university. It, in the U.S., we have this notion that you, know, you can reinvent yourself much, much later in life, and that you may come out of undergraduate school, have no idea what you really wanted to do, go take a job, find out you really hate it, and, and find out that you, you know, there's this other thing that you'd love to do, and the MBA is the way to get there. And I bet the vast majority of students at both Owen and Jones are career switchers, right? They're using the MBA to make a turn. It could be a different discipline, a different industry, different company, even a different location. Uh, uh, yeah, I definitely, uh, and it varies a bit across our programs and the, the type of students that they attract. Uh, but it, even if they didn't think that they were a career switcher when they came in, by the time they get through even, even the first semester, all of a sudden they're thinking about different opportunities and, and end up being a career switcher. Why is the MBA such a good uh, tool to switch careers? And to reinvent yourself. How did that happen? I think there's a couple pieces of magic there. Uh, one is the two-year program. And this is hotly debated in our industry. You know, should I do a one-year program? Because there are one-year programs out there and so forth. And uh, I think one-year programs would be great, uh, but they don't allow for that kind of reinvention. Uh, the reinvention takes a little more time, takes a summer internship. Um, you, know, you, you know, if you were working in finance and you wake up one morning and you go, I really, you know, I just love to think about brand and I'd love to go work in brand at Tesla. Well, I mean, to convince the world that, that you would really know something about brand, you kind of need something on your resume that looks like brand. 
And that's the summer internship. And it's that combination, I think, that really creates that pivot magic, as we would say. And that, that transformation, I think, is really aided. And again, this, the two years is important for this by the, the cohort that you're with. It's not an individual endeavor of acquiring a bunch of knowledge in, from textbooks or you know, we do still occasionally use textbooks. Uh, from, <laughs> They're all digital, right? <laughs> yes, from textbooks or from you know, a, a font of wisdom from the professor. So much of it is about what you learn about yourself, what you learn about performing in a team, what you learn about uh, transforming outwardly and inwardly. And that takes, that takes time. And it takes a combination of many ingredients. Which leads me to think that one of the underestimated values of an MBA experience is personal development. Uh, and that's even beyond professional development, mm -hmm. where people are uh, examined, assessed, uh, their gaps of skills are looked at and addressed in a customized way. Uh, they're given mentors, they're given one-on-one -on -one coaching. Most people really don't focus a whole lot on that, but that's a very big part of this transformation that you're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, all of our students we, uh, are, take a part of a program we call our Leadership Development Program, and it involves uh, assessments, one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching, a coach that'll follow you through the whole two years if you want. Um, and a lot of that coaching is thinking about, uh, you know, what, where, where will I really excel? What are the things that get me up in the morning? What, how can I position myself to be more successful? And how are people perceiving me in that area? And a lot of that's one-on-one -on -one coaching. Right. I think that is one of the biggest surprises for many students after they enter the program is the amount of work that they do on themselves uh, and self-awareness built into it as opposed to just learning a lot of, of facts and figures and equations and, and different technical skills. Uh, that so much of it is about what, what you would do with those, whether it's around uh, your ability to, for critical decision making, having difficult conversations, or just your self-awareness so you know how to uh, capitalize on your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. Having difficult conversations. That, that is actually hard for a lot of managers. Um, people who try to get the best out of other people often have difficulty in just telling it like it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, very true. How do you teach that? How do you, how I do wish you teach I that, Barbara? <laughs> in your own, I your own life, right? Yeah, I wish I would have had more practice uh, before I ever ended up in this uh, leadership position on having difficult conversations. I, the last five years would have been much less difficult if I were better at that. Yeah. And it's so many of these things people think they might be good at or, or don't see the blind side. They don't see the weakness. Uh, unless they really have somebody kind of helping them think about it. And, and then you realize, yeah, I have been avoiding that conversation with Joe for the last three weeks. Why? Because it's difficult, and I don't really want to have that conversation <laughs> with Joe. Right? One of the things we've been, been really emphasizing with our students over the last few years is to protect time to reflect. Mm -hmm. And that's important, I think, for this leader development. It's important for things like having difficult conversations and really thinking about when, okay, I, I had that conversation with Joe and you know, here's where it worked well, here's where it didn't. But if you don't reflect and close that loop, then you don't uh, learn as much from right. that experience to move on. So we've been trying to bake in, in some of our, our leadership programs and the mentorship, this, this uh, reminder to set aside that time to reflect, not just on the bullet points that you learned that day mm -hmm. in class, but on your experiences and, and what they say about your abilities and potential gaps. Right. Now, I want to ask a question that's on everyone's mind, which is the cost of the degree. A lot of people experience sticker shock these days when they look at the actual cost of an MBA degree. Do um, you think it's worth it? Why does it cost so much? It's worth it. But it is. And the ROIs still look, look really good on the, on the degree. Uh, it's something we have to pay a lot of attention to. And it is. It's tremendous. I, I'm humbled every year when I look at the students that have walked through our door and given up uh, not just two years of time, but a, but a 
a, a nice chunk of change. Um, a good job and <laughs> opportunity cost. The opportunity yeah. cost. It's, it's an incredible investment, and we owe them uh, the ability for, for that they can create for themselves a high return. We, we owe them that, the ingredients for that to happen. Uh, and the data indicate that it, that it still does, that the, that the jobs that you can get out of an MBA degree, with an MBA degree, are substantially different than those without, and that your ability to move up in the, in the company, uh, your ability to withstand the downturns, is much better with that MBA degree than without. I mean, when you think about it, we are by far the highest ROI on campus in terms of graduate degrees today. And, and not only that, but, uh, you know, you start thinking about things you're going to invest in. What, what would, what's more important than investing in yourself, right? And you know, this is your career, your life. It's not uh, some abstract, you know, stock or whatever that I'm investing in. It really is not just the ROI, which is strong, but it's a career of satisfying work that could really make a big difference uh, in your life and happiness. And I, and I think the payback uh, numbers are like two and a half, three and a half years, uh, and you get essentially paid back from um, your opportunity cost plus your tuition and fees. Yeah. In most cases. So of course, if you go to a one-year program, the payback might be quicker, but you may lose out on the transformation that Eric was talking about. Uh, and then there are, of course, other options today, uh, part-time, online, specialty master's degrees. Um, how, does, how, how does that fit into the play? So now Rice just opened up. The first cohort That's right. just entered mm -hmm. uh, recently, an online program. Mm -hmm. Tell us why you decided to do an online program, and what's the difference between an online program and a residential on-campus program? Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the MBA at Rice. It, it, it was a, a, a huge strategic decision for us to make. Uh, Dean Rodriguez worked with the faculty really from the day that he walked through the door to assess the possibility. It is uh, it's strategic in terms of both market position and being able to, to go where, where the market, uh, at least a portion of the market, is headed and an important part of the market. It's also strategic to be able to, to make the investments we want as a business school. Uh, we are, you know, there's, we, there are only, we're running out of classrooms. We're running out of uh, blocks on the calendar uh, to add residential programs. And we, we, we would like to, to add to our faculty. We would like to continue to grow the faculty in, in directions that are, that are uh, that we have gaps now that are becoming more important uh, so that it was, that type of growth uh, is important to us, and the expanding our our market in a truly diversified manner was was important. The so really it allows us in the you know, Texas market is huge. Uh, in our first cohort, not all of our students are from Texas, but the uh, large majority are from Texas. A Maybe it's 15% are actually within the Houston metropolitan area, and they really highly valued the flexibility. Uh, some very interesting cases in terms of who sought the MBA at Rice as opposed to coming to our on-campus uh, professional evening or weekend program. Uh, students that travel so often that they couldn't count on being here every other week or certainly two nights a week. The road warriors. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of those in our Houston firms. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a couple of examples, uh, both men and women, who were, uh, uh, their families were growing, and they, they felt like it would be less of a burden on the family. They, the timing was right for them to get an MBA in terms of the career, but they felt that the, uh, the inflexibility of the residential program was too great for the, the burden it would place on the family. So that, that, those were great stories that we could we could provide this opportunity for phenomenal candidates to meet them where they are. There's another great example of a, of a doctor who is, uh, she sold her practice and is going back to Korea. Uh, she could get a head start on the MBA and when she, so she'll be halfway around the world when she completes the MBA uh, next year. Hmm. So I think that, that flexibility angle, and it, it makes perfect sense to us that when we look at the phenomenal students we have in our professional programs that, that come from the 
companies in downtown Houston, there are students just like that sitting in uh, San Antonio, sitting in uh, Tulsa, sitting in uh, Fort Worth, and that the, they would like a Rice MBA as well, and they're fully qualified. So then the trick is how do we deliver it? And our faculty insisted that it be the, the same degree, uh, and we have the core curriculum and the uh, elective offerings look very similar to our on-campus. I mean, very similar, like, hmm. like, like, like the same. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's got to be a shorter menu on the of core. electives. So. Shorter menu of okay. electives. Right. Uh, the core is, is the same, including our, our capstone consulting project uh, that we do for not-for-profit uh, organizations at the end of the two years. The online students will, will do that as well, and they'll do it in a distributed virtual fashion, which will be an interesting experience for uh, everyone. And I think a, a good experience, something that people need to know how, how to be able to work effectively in that environment. And you're having weekly live classrooms mm -hmm. in addition to the online work where there's not a professor. Present. That's right. So that's a really important component. It's a hybrid program. It's actually hybrid, hybrid, hybrid. There's the asynchronous. Uh, it's about two-thirds of the, of the work each week. And then there's one-third live session. And those live sessions are done in kind of the Brady Bunch window style. Uh, and they, it, Peter and I held a, a, a partio uh, at the Jones party School. Mode. Yeah, at the Jones School, we have something called Party on the Patio. Uh, and those party, partios happen uh, every Thursday. And we decided we need to have an, a, a partio for the online students. Now, it wasn't quite the same, <laughs> uh, but it was, it was quite good and quite, quite a nice social gathering in this, you know, online live session environment. And that was important for us to see that you could get that kind of connection. It was also good to hear the students talk about how quickly, so as you said, we just launched our first cohort, so we are uh, two and a half months in. Uh, those students, the connections and bonds that they've already made in the same, which is so um, such an important part of the MBA experience, uh, they uh, sp spoke very uh, convincingly and movingly, really, about, their, about the relationships they, they developed with their fellow students already. And you're doing weekend immersions here every quarter, is that right? That's, yeah, that's the third hybrid leg. Right. So they actually come on campus uh, for required immersions and, and some of the material that we would like, really like to do in an intense on in-person uh, manner. And we also have a required global field experience in this program, just as we do in the other programs. So what do you sacrifice when you go online? What do you lose as a student? Oh, that's a great question. I think you lose, so you trade one uh, bit of flexibility and ease, and you lose on the other, on the other hand. You're going to have to work harder to network. You're going to have to work harder to take advantage of, and we're going to have to work harder to provide uh, the co-curricular aspects, the, the parts of the experience that round out the classroom. Mm -hmm. We're pretty comfortable with what we're doing with the, with the classroom content uh, and the ability to learn everything you need to know about corporate finance. Now we need to uh, make sure that we deliver on, on the rest of that experience that's wrapped around it, on the, on the networking, on the connections, on the, the having a difficult conversation, having right. the opportunities to, to uh, develop and lead a, in, a, in something that, that looks like a club environment, those sorts of things. Sure. But we struggle with a lot of that on the, on the fully employed programs yeah. in general. Yeah. Uh, Eric, would Vanderbilt ever consider an online MBA? Absolutely, but uh, you know, I think it all. What's interesting is this continuum, right? So, yes. Uh, when you start thinking about, we, we, we'll talk about online programs, but I think what Barbara's talking about is something that's very blended, right, mm -hmm. in many ways. And uh, for example, in the in the national market, we have an executive MBA program that has lots of these blended features. You know, where you're using different pieces of online uh, to make our students' life a little easier, mm -hmm. less, less time having to come to campus and so forth. Um, and every one of these programs, I think there's a continuum uh, that we see. And things that we're doing inside of our residential programs, all of our residential programs, where we're using more and more technology to flip the classroom or change the learning experience and make it more powerful. So, so, main, so mainly an online MBA would be for someone who doesn't want to quit his or her job who needs a very flexible program um, that they can take while they're having to travel uh, for work. 
um, and someone who just doesn't want to do the two full years on a campus. Right. Yeah. Or if they, 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 it doesn't make sense for them to quit their job and geographically they, they, uh, they can get a degree from a school that's the right fit for them without being there physically. Now, online MBAs tend to be a little bit older, um, almost edging into executive MBA territory, right? I think that's typically the case, at least in the, uh, so that's been the case with UNC, and uh, I'm not sure if it is for some of the larger uh -huh. state school models. Right. We've seen a bit younger than we expected, oh. uh, and it'll be interesting. We don't have much experience yet. We'll see how it actually uh, evens out. Uh, and I don't know if that has to do with the Texas market and the cities that we're drawing on and what their options are in those cities. But it's been a, it's, it's, it looks a bit more like our full-time work experience. Yeah. I mean, there are two big surprises to me in the online MBA market. Number one, uh, you would have thought that big brands like UNC or Indiana or USC or Rice uh, would have been able to break down the natural boundaries that exist all over the world uh, and protect educational institutions. Why go to a local or regional university when you can get a brand name university no matter where you are, even if you're in Tullahoosa, right? You, you can go to Rice. Uh, but that hasn't happened. Most of the people who enroll in online programs are within a 50-mile radius of the school, mm -hmm. which is a big surprise mm -hmm. to me. Second big, su big surprise is it ain't cheap. These are, these at the high end, uh, at branded schools, these are fairly expensive programs, and a number of them are in six figures, which surprises me. When we made the commitment that the program would be, then the degree would be the same degree as our on-campus, uh, we basically brought with that the notion then that this, this was not going to be MBA. MBA online did not mean MBA on the cheap, and the, the, the tuition for our professional online program uh, essentially matches our on-campus program. And lots and lots of investment on your mm -hmm. side, and likewise for us, everything yeah. we're doing online, we're investing a lot in to creating quality experiences. Right. I mean, the other thing about online is scholarships uh, are not as uh, plentiful mm -hmm. in uh, two-year MBA programs. As we know, we didn't mention this when we talked about the high sticker price, but the truth is, a very high percentage of MBA students do not pay that sticker price. There's tremendous amounts of scholarship money available out there. At Rice, I think the last number I saw was 85% of your full-time MBA students are on scholarship, right? It's in that neighborhood, yeah. maybe a little bit lower this year. We try to be strategic. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, so what I'm saying is you may actually be able to get, um, at a branded school, um, more, buck, more value for your buck in an MBA program given the scholarship support than you might even find in an online program, oddly. Right. Yeah, that is true. The opportunity cost, though. That's, that's Qu right. Quitting and the that's, job. And that's a big issue, mm -hmm. indeed. Now, there are two things that are facing business schools today in America that are kind of uh, tricky problems. We've, we've gone through a period with a lot of anti-immigration rhetoric. Uh, it's harder than ever to get an H-1B visa to work here if you're an international student. And increasingly, people are actually feeling less welcome if they weren't born in America. That has driven down the number of internationals in, in MBA applicant pools at every school, pretty much. Um, do you see that coming back in any, any meaningful way at any time soon? Hmm, it feels sad at the moment, right? And it, uh, certainly, you know, I think for many schools, and, and ours included, it wasn't so much that we were uh, uh, hugely dependent on international students. In fact, international students only represent about 20% of our student body. Mm. But they created a tremendous amount of global diversity. And uh, one of the things we worked on very hard every year was creating that global diversity. So we would have 30, 35 countries in the building uh, every year and the richness that comes from that. And um, it's a, in many ways just a tragedy that, that we as a country right now are very short-sighted in thinking around that topic. I completely agree. I think sad is a, is a good description for it, and, uh, and that, that richness that uh, international students bring to the experiences, you just can't replace it. The 
And then you put uh, Hurricane Harvey on top of that, and uh, right. yes. <laughs> so we're, we're, we've Arise. just we've just hit the uh, one year anniversary, and we'll we'll see yeah. if we get past this hurricane uh, season. But that that it was uh, it, it was a um, it was an interesting year last year uh, for for us, and we uh, created a phenomenal class, and we ended up with a, a you know, excellent representation from international students. But we had to uh, approach it in very different ways. And I think we'll, as an industry, we're going to have to continue to do that. I mean, in many ways, it tells you how deep the applicant pools are and how rich they are, uh, because uh, most schools in the past year have experienced uh, declines in applications, in some cases in double digits. Uh, but you see no real material decline in the quality of the students as measured by the typical admission stats that you can see, at least, right? That's right. I mean, the other big issue facing um, business schools is the number of women, uh, both as students and as faculty. Uh, for the first time ever, a prominent school this year reached gender parity. It was USC Marshall at 52%. I don't really understand completely how they did it, except their students, phenomenal. the students really mobilized and really worked hard to make that happen. Uh, I think Kellogg hit 46%, which was a record for that school. Uh, and, and some of the schools are able to push into the 40s now. But what you see is that those schools apparently are dipping deeper into the pool because other schools now, they see women in enrollment falling. Um, why aren't schools gender, reaching gender parities easily, like med schools and law schools? What's the difference? Who wants to take that? Barbara, why don't you take that? I, I think the... Because you're, you're a rare woman in the business field, and even more so in finance. That's right. Right? You're not OB or marketing. <laughs> <laughs> the, and there are a lot more women uh, PhDs in uh, finance now and in operations. And, uh, I, th I think we're making some good uh, progress that way, and that's important in terms of the role, role models yeah. as well, that, totally. that, the, that the students, men and women, uh, see teaching their classes. So I think there is there's a bit of a cyclical effect there uh, in terms of, of getting the, uh, the 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 faculty. That's a really important piece of it. I think the the life cycle issue is not unimportant in this experience factor, where making that decision rather than right out of undergrad, go to law school, go to med school, keep on trucking, and uh, then. Uh, you know, somewhere in there you start worrying about your personal life sure. and uh, uh, family plans and that sort of thing. The, the MBA with that different cadence, I think, is, is really in many times bad timing for women. Yep. And I don't know as an industry what we do about that. I think we can be more creative uh, about one of the, the online MBA, our cohort, we have... Uh, Closer to 40% women, mm -hmm. uh, so that's a nice uh, increase in the in the online environment. And it may be that that flexibility is part of what uh, women in their late 20s, early 30s need to to make this work. I think it's also a good question uh, that I struggle with in terms of the of the career progression. The uh, the women have to be convinced that if they make that investment, take the two years off, spend the money, that they will get the opportunities for advancement that their, that their male colleagues will. And if there's any doubt or hesitation about that, it's going to decrease their interest in making the investment. Right, so the glass ceiling mm -hmm. has something to do That's with real. it as well. And I think now, you know, the industry in many ways, uh, many of these one-year programs that have developed over the last decade are also part of the factor now. And we see in our one-year programs, like our Masters of uh, Accountancy or Masters of Marketing, um, much more parity in some fact, mm -hmm. case in our Master of Marketing is uh, women-dominated in, in our at Vanderbilt. But and that's the, a pre-experience program. Pre-experience program, so it's exactly. back to your law medicine comparison, you know, you yep. straight out of undergrad into those right. programs. Yeah, exactly. So we want to open it up to you. Uh, if you have any questions, now is your chance to ask uh, the deans. Uh, and don't make me cold call you because that's, <laughs> you know, that's an important feature of a business school experience. Uh, anyone have a question? Yes, right here. I think we're going to bring you a mic maybe. Just because of the live stream, 
so that people all over the world can see you and hear you. Tell us who you are first off. All right, my name is Jake Cortez. I just got out of the Army after 11 years, so I'm new to Houston, Texas. So I appreciate the event you put on, even though it's a feverish crowd. <laughs> so y'all talked about well, a lot. Well, thank you for you. coming. Appreciate it. So y'all talked a lot about all the benefits of the NBA, but one thing maybe a few of us are working through a challenge is timing. So when I presented this opportunity to you know, my current boss, he talked a lot about building more experience opposed to getting an education. How would you respond to that same question? Now, that's interesting because, okay, here's someone who served this country, uh, spent a lot of time in the military, and obviously doesn't have a lot of business experience yet. Um, I see the degree as a perfect tool to actually make a transition mm -hmm. from the military into civilian life. But, but to his point, his boss is telling him, nah, don't, don't, <laughs> don't spend your money on those expensive MBA programs. Just stay right where you are, work for me, and you'll learn everything you need to know about business. Yeah. What do you two say about that? He needs to talk with his boss about incentive alignment and... Uh... <laughs> I mean, certainly one of the things that uh, you know, we're all working on is better and better support for our vets that come back and, um, uh, at Vayner, but we've been putting a lot of energy into that. In fact, yesterday we announced a new $25 million endowed scholarship for vets. And um, at, at full scale, that'll fund 40 students uh, at Vanderbilt. And we want to make it possible for vets to come and to be able to have that transition. And I think that's true across the industry. I think every school has been working to make that possible. I think in terms of that, that decision of when to come back, the, the experience is important. Uh, and I, you can see in the classroom, yeah. you know, those that have a little bit more context that... Uh, so the frameworks, what we really try to do is, is embed a bunch of frameworks, right, in, in your head that you can rely on for the rest of your life. Those frameworks, when, you have, when there's a context that the frameworks are being, being introduced into, uh, I, I think it can be really important. So the experience isn't just an arbitrary requirement in, or a desire in the MBA. It's, it's there for a reason in terms of how it uh, facilitates the, the depth of learning. But there's also just maturity that's important, and you have that from the, the time you've spent in the military, and some awareness of, of uh, from, the, from the people side, you know, how people work together to get something done. Teams, managing yes. teams. I mean, we find uh, our vets uh, many times, in the end, are leading a lot of things around mm -hmm. the school because they have a lot of natural leadership uh, skill building in the military. Business Definitely. schools love vets because they're highly disciplined. They've had leadership, teamwork, and collaboration experience. And your experience in the military is just as valuable as experience in the business setting. So you have the experience and the wherewithal to go into an MBA program and to excel. And when you get out of that program, have a lot more options than you probably currently do now. I would say don't wait. You've, you're, you're mature enough. If you're going to do it, you got to do it now and go for it. And I think you will never regret the decision. That's my own personal uh, advice. It'll open up a lot of opportunities that you just can't even imagine now that will be there for you. Definitely, really appreciate it. Good luck to you. Anyone else? So you know, one one of the things I want to ask about is uh, uh, this notion that geography in a business school is often destiny. You know, you, you go to Columbia or NYU in New York, you're more likely uh, than if you went to, to another school to work in finance or Wall Street. Um, at Rice, uh, energy is an important part of uh, Houston. At Vanderbilt, healthcare is uh, an important part of the local economy there. And so um, your two programs probably have deeper expertise in healthcare and in energy than many other business schools, yes? Yes. And it's a function of the local economy and its importance uh, to, to the community. So if there are people here who are thinking about energy or they're thinking about healthcare, these are two of the best schools in the world to go to and to explore your career options there. The other thing that happens is wherever a school is local, of course, its alumni tends to cling close to home. Uh, yes, alumni does spread all over the world and and I'm sure you people have uh, alumni in almost every major country, uh, and in Silicon Valley, and in New York, and in the Midwest as well. Um, but the alumni networks tend to be strongest where the schools are. And, uh, and
and they tend to be strong in those local industries that are really strong. So the networking effect of going to a school uh, where there's an industry dominant uh, is, is very useful, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, it's still true that at Vanderbilt, more than half our students come from outside the Southeast, and more than half leave the Southeast. Right. Uh, roughly a quarter of them all head to the West Coast now and head out to the Bay Area and Seattle. But certainly some of our students come to Vanderbilt because they love Nashville, they can see their lives and careers there, they want to be part of the healthcare uh, industry. It's a great huge town, in Nashville, great over 400 companies in healthcare in Nashville, 18 that are publicly traded, you know, so it, it is certainly uh, a big feature and roughly 20% of our students will do that. They'll stay in, in the healthcare industry uh, because that's really where they want to be. Which is about four times the business school average where it's pretty much 5% in yeah. the most right. of the schools. Right. Yeah. But what about an energy, an alternative energy? Yeah, so the, it's interesting in terms of students who uh, either um, move to Houston and to join an energy firm and then decide to get their MBA. So they're really coming from somewhere else, bringing their uh, experience from somewhere else, which is fantastic. Uh, but they've, they've found they love the industry or found they love Houston. Uh, we also find with students that come from outside of, uh, of Houston and Texas that uh, it's a really phenomenal place to live. Uh, after they live here for two years of the MBA, uh, they, the, we're like, okay, go, go back out. And, and many do, uh, but, but many also decide that, all right, this is a great, great spot to land. Uh, and if the uh, energy companies are becoming increasingly technology companies, right, exactly. uh, certainly with uh, alternative energy, much of that is, uh, you know, it, it looks like a tech company. Uh, and then the, the other thing that we've seen in both energy and, and healthcare is the uh, increasingly uh, opportunities in boutique consulting, boutique financing opportunities that are where that experience, industry experience, is really highly valued in the, in, the, in the boutique. So the students, that'll depend a lot on the students' independent career goals. If they want to go, uh, you know, for a big, big investment banking firm, uh, you know, any stripe, or uh, uh, leverage the opportunities with, the, with these boutique firms. So Eric, is Nashville going to be Amazon's pick for its second mm -hmm. headquarters? I don't know. Uh, you know, certainly uh, Nashville has a lot of components that are attractive to Amazon. Uh, we have a kind of a creative culture because of the music industry, and there's a lot of, of the kind of cultural and, and youth atmosphere of the city. But, you know, given our size and our growth and so forth, whether that's going to fit all of Amazon's components, I'm not so sure. Okay, last question. So what's your best advice to someone who's uh, in the early phase of the journey to a business school? Uh, they kind of know that they want to go, um, but they don't know how to determine fit or where they should go. What advice do you have for them, Barbara? I would recommend uh, really diving in on, the, uh, on two aspects of this. Well, let's maybe three. Uh, but a lot of it is that fit is important uh, in terms of, and you'll see that by how you connect with other students, uh, by the, the general attitude and demeanor of the students and the staff and the faculty when you visit the school or have the, the phone calls or the webinars. Uh, the size issue can be a big determinant uh, in terms of where you even want to look. Do you want to be at a school that's smaller, uh, that is easier to build community acro across the entire cohort, or do you, do you think you want to be uh, in, a, in a bigger pond? And, uh, and, and some of those, the schools with the much larger uh, student populations bring some, of the, some advantages that size brings, and it's, it's very individual, that trade-off for you. I think that might be one of the first most important decisions to make, is if you think you want to be part of a larger school, larger program, or if you want to be part of a program that a smaller program and with the community aspects that that brings, uh, you know, not only with your classmates, but with, the, with alumni, with uh, faculty, and, and certainly with staff as well. I think that's key. Uh, and th then the particular, you can learn a lot from looking at the, the programs in terms of what the, what the school values. What does their core curriculum look like? Do you, are you 
Is there a, a, a strong tilt in one direction or another? What sort of opportunities do you have in the first year uh, to think about uh, where you want to specialize? What kind of opportunities do you have to do experiential learning, which is, which is something that many schools are, are uh, introducing uh, new and really creative ways to, to think about applied learning? So I, I recommend to take the time. Don't think that all, all curriculums are the same and all programs the same. Really take the time to study the program and, and engage with the students about the program uh, as, well as, the, as well as the staff. I'll leave it at those two. Eric? You know, I, I would just echo that. And I think more than anything, plan a visit. Uh, go visit the school that you're thinking about. Uh, all of us will create uh, opportunities to do that, and many times, uh, opportunities where you can come for a weekend and really get to meet uh, the current students, meet alumni, hear their stories, uh, hear how they approach the decision and where they're headed and where they see their, their classmates headed. I think that so many times I hear from students who join us is the really defining thing. They come and they see and they think, you know, hey, I, I, I could see myself here. Mm -hmm. What about rankings? Certainly rankings are important. Reputation, you know, whether that reputation and where that reputation will carry you. You know, I think that uh, your point earlier about uh, the regional strength of schools and uh, industries that the schools factor into, all of that's really important. I, I'll, I'll give a, a plug for the uh, poet and quants uh, approach. Oh. I, I really like the ability to be able to put your weights and your, here are the things that I want to look at. Now, how do the schools stack up? Yeah. I, you know, obviously I'm not a great fan of rankings, even though I created one a while ago that started this monster uh, roaming the earth and terrorizing business schools <laughs> all over the world. Uh, but, um, you know, directionally over time, uh, I think you do get to some sort of greater truth some way, somehow. Um, but any given ranking and any given school's rank uh, don't trust it, treat it with a very big grain of salt. These things are very flawed. There's no perfect way to measure the quality of an educational experience. And, uh, and the way it's measured by journalists is often uh, misinformed, misguided, and mindless. Uh, and, and I think that ranking... You sound like, you sound like a, a dean of a business school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so... Um, Look at them, be entertained by them, but don't treat them too seriously is my advice. And I'm sure that's your advice as well. I agree. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much for, for a terrific discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, Eric. Thanks for coming down and uh, spending some time with us. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. And this is John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Thanks for watching out there.